Okay, in this one we're going to be dealing with the corticospinal tract. Um, I'm not quite sure what my uh, silly drawing has to do with it, but you must understand at this stage in the course I do need to amuse myself in several ways. This is just one means by which I do that. There will be some others. Now, let's see what this uh, tract has to offer. It is, of course, the most important tract you need to know because when it goes wrong we have something known as paralysis or hemiparesis, which is weakness, and we need to understand exactly what happens when there is a lesion. But first of all, we need to understand how the tract actually works and is, uh, is arranged anatomically. So what we must do is we must draw on our midline here, and I'm going to just go down as far as that for the time being. We'll find out why later. And we need to draw on our relevant areas of cortex up here which are relevant to voluntary motor control. We are of course going to have our main area here which is the primary motor cortex, that strip of cortex which is responsible for initiating voluntary motor control. We're going to have an association area which is motor in function and is called a supplementary motor area. That's one of those motor areas. The other part is known as the premotor area in here. So these are motor. So let's just label those as motor, which is here. And we are going to have, believe it or not, um, some axons leaving the primary sensory cortex. Okay, so this is sensory in here. Okay, so we'll come on and explain exactly where that is relevant in a few moments' time, but it's fair to say that we are going to have a large majority of what we call upper motor neurons, and we need to change colour here. We'll use blue for the actual pathway itself. So we're going to have upper motor neurons, UMN, we have upper motor neurons leaving all of these areas in here, and collectively journeying down to the internal capsule through something known as the corona radiata. This is just a name for the white matter below the cortex in the cerebrum. That's, uh, that's the name for that white matter. And that's the anatomical location in which the first upper motor neurons in this pathway travel. Joining this pathway, we are, of course, going to have axons from the primary sensory cortex. Now, it's pretty obvious why the association motor cortex and the primary motor cortex are involved in the cortical spinal tract. It's probably not so obvious why the primary sensory cortex is involved in the initiation of voluntary motor control. To explain, explain very, very briefly, it's all about modulation and it's all about uh, influencing incoming sensory signals. I said to you before in previous teaching sessions about how the brain likes to either dampen down or amplify a signal or, or create contrast between incoming signals so that it can make sure that it prioritizes incoming information and makes us aware of the most salient signal or the most important signal. Now the primary sensory cortex allows upper motor neurons to travel down as part of the cortical spinal tract to end up ramifying on the dorsal horn cells which are belong to the dorsal column medial luminiscal pathway particularly with those which are transmitting uh, conscious proprioceptive information and this is really to regulate that proprioceptive information so because the corticospinal tract has been um, activated, it means that the sensory signals coming back need to be prioritised. So let's say, for example, we want to move the lower limbs for walking, and actually the proprioceptive information coming from the upper arm and the shoulder needs to be dampened down. Well, what we can do is the axons coming from the primary sensory cortex 
which ramify on those sensory neurons as part of the dorsal column medial luminiscal pathway can make sure that only selective information, proprioceptive information, relating to lower limb movement is travelling back to the cortex and being processed by the cortex. It's unlikely that the other information regarding the rest of the body um, will have its signal interpreted to the same degree. So we have sensory input prioritised that is specifically related to the voluntary movement in question and that is why we have a contribution to the corticospinal tract from the primary sensory cortex. So where does it go from here? So let's continue down. We've gone through the corona radiata. This is an anatomical location. The next is going to be through the internal capsule. Okay? And the internal capsule is an area inside the cerebrum which I've said is really really important and we must understand where particular fibres travel through that capsule. Okay? So very quickly let's just move away from the cortical spinal tract and draw a representation of the internal capsule. Okay? So this is the inter internal capsule and we can actually label it as saying we have an anterior limb, we have an area in the middle called the genu and we have a posterior limb. And it is in the posterior limb that corticospinal tract fibres pass. Okay? It's worth remembering that the fibres will travel in this portion of the internal capsule. So let's go back to our journey of the corticospinal tract. We've gone through the corona radiata, we've gone through the internal capsule, and all this time we are getting closer to the midline over here and eventually we're going to allow the corticospinal tract to group together so these fibres are quite sparse and now they're going to come through the midbrain an area known as the cerebral cruse so it goes through the cerebral cruse part of the anterior portion of the midbrain and then it's going to reach the medulla and all these fibres are going to converge to form a bulge on the anterior surface of the medulla oblongata. So we're in the medulla oblongata and the pyramids. And it's the pyramids that form this bulge. And this would be in what we would call the caudal medulla, where the fibres would gather. And and eventually cross. So in the caudal medulla is where the crossing takes place. And so we're going to get a point of decussation, a point of crossing over, which is in the caudal medulla. So caudal, caudal medulla there. So these are anatomical locations that have, uh, have seen the corticospinal tract travel through. Now at the moment we have no distinguished aspect of the cortical spinal tract. We don't have an anterior or a lateral cortical spinal tract. That's going to happen at this point here, which is the point of decussation. And what happens is we get about 85% or 90% of fibres travelling in the lateral cortical spinal tract. And we get the remainder of 10 to 15% travelling as part of the anterior cortical spinal tract. Okay, so what we need to now draw on is the entry of our cortical spinal tract inside the spinal cord because the tract is now about to enter the spinal cord. So we're just going to draw on a cross section here of the spinal cord. This is our dorsal column at the back. So this dotted line represents, inside that dotted line at least, will represent the grey matter and the outside of the dotted line we have the white matter. So at this point we're going to get crossing over of the lateral cortical spinal tract and this will travel down through the spinal cord on the opposite side. So we're going to get, we need to go back to blue for that to continue the tract and it's going to travel in an anatomical location called 
the lateral funiculus and you've heard of this before because it's the same area as lateral in the white matter where the sensory tract, the spinothalamic tract passes but this time they're descending fibres that are very close to where the sensory fibres would travel back up to the cortex but here we've got the lateral funiculus and we've got lateral corticospinal tract fibres coming down eventually at very segmental levels Normally at the lumbar and the brachial plexus would be the most uh, prominent examples where we see a bulge in the spinal cord and lots of uh, alpha motor neurons actually coming out into the periphery. We would see a synapse of this upper motor neuron up here with lower motor neurons which have their cell bodies here in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. So we would see a synapse here, um, so we would see that come out here and we would see the synapse here and then this would be our lower motor neuron. Okay, so our lower motor neuron now is going to enter, go into the periphery and eventually innervate skeletal muscle. Let's now journey back to our anterior corticospinal tract. The anterior corticospinal tract, remember, remains uncrossed. So this travels in the spinal cord uncrossed in an anterior position and if I just create a little bit more space in here and we just draw on our grey matter a little bit shorter there so we can just create a area for the anterior corticospinal tract so we're going to end up with uncrossed fibres so our midline is here, don't forget, we've got uncrossed fibres that are going to travel down as part of the anterior cortical spinal tract and they are then, once they reach their segmental level, they're going to cross through this anterior white commissure, again, which we've heard of before, eventually to reach these anterior or ventral horn cells which is where they ramify on lower motor neurons and we get crossing over of the anterior corticospinal tract at segmental level. Okay, so this would be the anterior corticospinal tract, and of course, this would be the lateral corticospinal tract. So that pretty much wraps up everything we need to know anatomically about the corticospinal tract. Just before I go, it's worth probably mentioning just the functional differences between the two tracts. It is the lateral corticospinal tract that tends to go to distal limb musculature, so distal parts of the upper and lower limb, for fine control in manual dexterity tasks that gives us the fine and precise control of our limbs, particularly the upper limb. The anterior corticospinal tract tends to deal with axial muscle groups that are close to the, um, the spinal cord, particularly muscle groups like erector spinae, etc. And they're more involved in stabilisation and balance um, during uh, motor activity.